I was about eight years old, I attended elementary school uh, in the city of Rome. And I remember very clearly that one day we had a new student coming to our class, joining our class. He sat among us, then the teacher arrived, and the first thing she said to the new student, please go out of the classroom without providing any explanation. The door closed behind him, and then the teacher told us, now we can pray. Because it was customary at the time to start our day by saying all together the Lord's Prayer. After the prayer, the teacher opened the door and told the student, you can come back in with us. For us, we were just eight years old, it was 1968, the um, episode was really um, bewildering. It didn't make any sense. What was the problem? Why this new student who looked exactly like us couldn't pray with us? So at the end of the first hour, we approached the teacher and we asked her, why was he booted out of the classroom? What did he do? And I remember very distinctly what the teacher said. She said, he's a Jew. We cannot pray with the Jews. We cannot say our Lord's prayers with those who crucified him. And that was the end of the episode. So I remember that I was very perplexed. That was the first time in my life in which I heard the word Jew. So the word was very mysterious. Um, the episode was incomprehensible. So when I went home, I talked with my father and I asked him, who is a Jew? Uh, what happened. So my father, at that point, uh, he took a deep breath and he said that what I witnessed was a very sad episode. Actually, he was pretty angry at the teacher. He said, this is a shameful episode. And he told me something about the Jews of Rome. So I learned that just 30 years before, in 1938, the Jews were discriminated and persecuted by the Italian fascist regime with the racial laws. Actually, the students were evicted from public schools. And then I learned that on October the 16th, 1943, uh, there was a dragnet by the German army, by the SS, who deported the vast majority of the Jewish community of Rome to Auschwitz. And very few returned. So what I've learned, uh, although I was just eight years old trying to put together these pieces of information, I thought, well, okay, let's sum it up. The church condemned them from a religious point of view. The fascist regime discriminate them and persecute them politically, and the Nazi physically exterminate them. So um, why is anti-Semitism a Christian problem? Well, I was a Christian. I was a Catholic growing up in a public school. And all of a sudden, I had a problem with this student whom I didn't know, who looked exactly like one of us, and, that who never, and, and nevertheless, he was kicked out of school, and he was, so to speak, uh, described as a enemy of our religion. But anti-Semitism is indeed a Christian problem. After the end of the Second World War, the French Catholic philosopher Jacques Maritain addressed Pope Pius XII himself. He wrote a letter to Montini, who was at the time was the Secretary of State, saying, I am willing to understand why the Pope kept silence during the Second World War in order not to break the position of neutrality of the Church and perhaps to help the clandestine network of monasteries and churches to help the persecuted Jews. But now, he said, now it's the time to bring a complete change, a revolution in the Christian teaching about the Jews Judaism and so forth. And Maritain was very, very forceful in considering anti-Semitism 
not only a problem for the modern world or for the open society or for the Jews, but he was very, very forceful about perceiving anti-Semitism as a Christian problem. So he actually had a meeting with the high hierarchy in Rome, but he was bitterly disappointed. He wrote to himself, Christian conscience is completely poisoned, in poisonne. It took him other almost 30 years to see the dawn of a new day. He was still alive when in 1965, the Declaration Nostra Etate um, issued under Pope Paul VI changed the teaching of the church concerning the Jews. But obviously the revolution was not complete. And now I will talk about anti-Semitism as a Christian problem as it is today, addressing three aspects of this problem. First of all, the problem is theological. It is a theological problem for the Christian churches to reinterpret the old interpretation of the perseverance of the Jewish faith in the world. The old theological frame according to which the Jews rejected Jesus as the Messiah, the old idea that nevertheless God wants them to go through history as indirect uh, testes veritatis, indirect witness of the truth of the church and therefore condemned to a series of discrimination and disgraces throughout history is no longer working. So the first problem for the church today and the Christian churches today is to go back to this basic aspect of their interpretation of Jewish history and see how much a space Christianity has to reinterpret and rethink this old paradigm. The second problem is historical. In other words, it has become very, very clear that in the 19th century, the Christian churches were um, complicit in transforming the old theological anti-Judaism or anti-Semitism into a new type of anti-Semitism, in a vicious type of political anti-Semitism. And this was done at the end of the 19th century as a weapon against the development of open societies in Europe. In other words, anti-Semitism, the old prejudices, were reorganized and restructured in order to serve as a direct attack against the separation between church and state, um, the right to vote, and the um, development of uh, democratic structures in Europe that Pope Pius IX and Pope Leo XIII feared could bring down the uh, European society as a Christian society. So the problem historically is how does Christianity perceives and reinterprets its own ancient long-standing hatred or history of anti-Semitism. In other words, we have made some progress from this point of view. There is now, a, generally speaking, an acknowledgement of a problem. But still, we have a long way to go. Why? Because there is still the trend among Catholic historians or within church uh, environments to say, well, okay, yes, uh, it was um, truly shameful. We have a tradition of anti-Judaism, perhaps a little bit of anti-Semitism, but this is purely religious, this is purely theological. It has nothing to do with the development that eventually um, uh, created the circumstances that allowed for Nazi anti-Semitism to thrive and explode. Then we have a political problem. The political problem is still present today. 
And it's represented by the fact that anti-Semitism is unfortunately alive and well still today, and that it really um, thrives in certain environments that are particularly traditionally oriented and particularly, I would say, conservative. This is particularly interesting if we take a look at the community by the Lefebvre. Um, if you take a look at the uh, traditionalists, uh, the Lefebvreans, uh, we do have, on the one hand, a staunch um, defense of the Latin Mass, of everything that the Vatican Council I in 1870 said, a rejection of the authority of the Second Vatican Council and the novelties. But at the same time, these um, environments are strictly connected with ideas that are, um, that are coming directly from a long-standing political um, anti-Semitism. And um, <clears throat> these problems are compounded in a document which is a document that was issued by the Vatican in 1998. It's called, We Remember, A Reflection on the Shoah. The intentions are good. It is an attempt to reassess the responsibility of the Christian churches and specifically of the Catholic Church in relation to the Holocaust. But the document fails and fails utterly in recognizing that um, Nazi, and Nazi, Nazi anti-Semitism, although racial anti-Semitism, drew all his weaponry from a long-standing tradition of Christian um, anti-Semitism. And now we come to our present day. I had a meeting with the chief rabbi of Rome, Riccardo Di Segni, very recently, this in September, and uh, I interviewed him. And we, sp we spoke about the present situation of the relationship between um, the Jewish community of Rome and Judaism as a whole and the Catholic Church. Riccardo Di Segni told me <clears throat> that since Pope Francis I, uh, became Pope, he experienced surprise after surprise. He said, certainly Karol Wojtyla, Pope John Paul II, um, moved things, uh, so to speak, forward, for example, through his historic uh, visit to the Jewish synagogue of Rome. But he said that the thing that for him was the most striking was the fact that for the first time, it seems from certain words and speeches of the Pope, that he is willing to recognize for the first time that Judaism and the Jews exist theologically, historically, politically, not only to uh, bear witness, indirect witness, Okay, sub contraria specie of the Christian church, but that their religion, their hope for a better world, their understanding of messianism has a right to exist and is a treasure in itself, regardless of its connection with Christianity. And one more thing that I would like to add just a, a couple of weeks ago, uh, there was a special uh, a celebration to remember the dragnet and the deportation of the Jews of Rome, October the 16th, 1943. So it was the uh, 70th, 70th um, uh, anniversary. On that occasion, uh, the Pope um, said, although a lot of Christians at the time were completely or utterly oblivious okay, of the, uh, wrong, of the uh, mistakes they, uh, and the distortions of the teaching they received from their church. 
um, concerning the Jews. Nevertheless, some of them were capable of extending their help to the Jews and do the right thing. Now, what we hope um, and uh, that in understanding that anti-Semitism is a Christian problem, and it's a Christian problem that is very, very serious, we will be able from now on, so to speak, to build on the um, elements that were established during the Vatican Council II, 1965, and we will be able, so to speak, to move forward. Thank you.